sympathy is going to cause you a problem. Empathy is a hostage negotiator, as I would define it, as Harvard would define it, one of Daniel Goleman's definitions of it. It's got nothing to do with your emotions. It's got you identifying the other side's emotions completely. And so your emotions might kick into gear at some point in time afterwards. But it's just really identifying the emotional the emotions, the cognitive biases, the affects, the reactions from the other side. And then by definition, Goldman says, he calls it cognitive empathy. And he says it's a type of empathy that social paths are actually best at. And it's insanely effective. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. Mr. Chris Voss, who is, simply put, just a badass. He was the lead international kidnapping negotiator for the FBI, as well as the FBI's hostage negotiation representative for the National Security Council Hostage Working Group. He served as the lead crisis negotiator for the New York City Division of the FBI. And Chris was also a member of the New York City Joint Terrorist Task Force for 14 years. And as a negotiator, he stopped hostage taking in a bank robbery. He was the case agent on the Blind Sheik case. And during Chris's 24 year tenure in the Bureau, he was trained in the art of negotiation by not only the FBI, but Scotland Yard and Harvard Law School. So he comes at it from all angles. And Christopher has taught business negotiation in the MBA programs at many of the world's leading schools, including Harvard and USC, and works as the managing director of the kidnapping resolution practice for inside security. And in a crisis or negotiation, he is who you want by your side. So huge thank you for joining us today, Chris. And then also, I just want to mention your book, Never Split the Difference, which is phenomenal. And I think an absolute must read. And I've seen it myself, both read and love it. So, yeah, huge thank you for joining us today, Chris. Let me jump in on a couple of things, if I may. First of all, you know, now it's never split the difference of Black Swan Group. It's all business negotiation all the time. Actually, all the hostage stuff's in my rearview mirror. And I used to think I was a badass until a couple of years ago I met this guy named Steven. <laughs> he walks up to me and he says, hey, just so you know, I've broken 84 bones in my body. And I'm like, this is going to be an interesting conversation. I got to hear about this guy. <laughs> I will also say the Kung Fu works. Chris has coached me through a couple of very tricky, complicated, up and down negotiations. And those are situations that I am just not wired for. I am not built for them. I'm way too much of a pussy. And, uh, and, and Chris is really, uh, Chris's voodoo works, which to me, we like to backtrack stuff to the neurobiology can we understand mechanism and then we like to roll it forward into the world and right. see does the voodoo work the voodoo doesn't work we're not interested right. why bother decoding our allergy that's really hard so we want to come in you know from both angles at once and i think which is kind of part of at the heart of the collective so there's something experimental about it your voodoo works thank um, you brother yeah well you're coachable <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it works incredibly well. We all implemented it here at the Flow Research Collective. So, Chris, I want to just dive in with a question around uh, state, which is something we talk a lot about here at the Flow Research Collective. So could you tell us a little bit about how you think about regulating your own state, how you feel from a nervous system perspective before a negotiation, what is optimal from that perspective? Yeah, well, a positive frame of mind. I mean, you know, the stuff that I've read, as Stephen's written, and other places which corroborates it. I mean, you got to get in a positive frame of mind. And we're not naturally wired to be positive. Survival mode is largely negative. So how do I think of it? You know, I think of it kind of like oral hygiene. Not only is it daily, it's a couple of times a day. I mean, just because I brushed my teeth yesterday, 
doesn't mean I don't got to brush them again today. Just because I brushed them this morning doesn't mean I got to hit it again sometime later today. Especially in these times when our survival mechanisms are being triggered even more, when survival mode is negative. Success mode is positive. You've got to consciously make the switch because your natural wiring is not there. So, and thank God that I've run across the stuff that Stephen's written about flow because it's gained us a lot of insight into how do we teach negotiations so that people maximize their outcomes. They don't leave money on the table. And it all revolves around, you know, what's your positive frame of mind because you're smarter in a positive frame of mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super interesting. The way I've thought about it or tried to think about it is that whoever has the better regulated nervous system wins. And obviously there's a ton oh, more okay. to it than that. But with people that I've gotten destroyed with in the past in negotiations, they've always just been much more centered, much more calm, much more able to just hold their nerves and ride through all circumstances. So when you say... You know, it's, it's a constant battle and it's like brushing your teeth. What, what are you referring to? Are there certain practices or things that you do in order to stay in a good or optimal state of mind? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first thing I do when I get out of bed, you know, is going to be brush my teeth. First thing I got to do, I got to go through some sort of positive mind frame exercise. Now, the time I spent in California, I know it sounds nuts and berries and hugs and kisses, but look, the gratitude thing works. I mean, you know, dial in on some gratitude, some specific reasons, you know, along the learning and accelerated learning path that we teach people to do. Handwriting makes a difference on your focus. So I do handwritten things that I'm grateful for each morning. Any sort of, you know, trying to maximize my mental resources is going to have to involve handwriting. I ran across an article recently that talked about how much Bruce Lee kept handwritten journals and handwritten notes and meticulously written. Now, from what I know about handwriting, I know that I'm more focused, more mentally on my game when I handwrite. So I work that into my daily ritual. We work that into our training. There's a connection between handwriting and memory, too, because you're involving more uh, senses. It's tactile. So when you're writing by hand, write tactile with visual, with the auditory, especially if you're you know, trying to write in a stylist manner, you're paying attention to the auditory, the rhythm, right? That is very, you know, I always take notes and try to like it a cool, fun shorthand for myself, just because it gives it a little beat coupled with the handwriting. It just helps lock it the memory more. It's just a mnemonic thing. We use it too at the Flurries Collective and we teach people to do gratitude lists by hand. Do you use 10 things you're grateful for, trying to really feel them? Do you do three things and turn one into a paragraph, which is the positive psychology version that a lot of people prefer? Do you vary it up? Yeah, I'll shoot for three things. Normally when I get started, they got to be little things, appreciate the little things. I'll end up with more than three and a number of much broader things. As what I'm trying to cycle into what I am cycling into my day now is revisit it in a handwritten fashion a couple times through the day. Ideally a theme for the day emerges. Mm. Mm. Oh that's neat. Mm. That's really interesting. So it's an on kind of like an ongoing journaling practice throughout the whole day. Yeah it is. Absolutely. You know, and ideally each day I've always had a trouble distinguishing days because I get so up in my head. Like, I don't remember when that happened. Could have happened a week ago. Could have happened six months ago. So I'm trying to slow time down to some degree. Like, mm -hmm. getting more present in the day. And if the day can suggest a theme for the day, like, today has opened my mind up. Just open up. If you, you know, which is get out of my head a little bit more. Open more to the day. Let me hear what's in today. I love that. So that uh, it'll be a unique day. Yeah, very interesting strategy to try and shift the perception of time passing, I think. I know that... Uh, I've been finding time passing so bizarrely in quarantine. You know, it's just like, zap. it keep, feels like it's constantly Friday. <laughs> it keeps saying, how the hell is another week gone by? Um, but so obviously, Chris, you know that at the Flow Research Collective, our whole thing is flow. So I'd love to dive into that in relation to negotiation. And if you have felt in the past, amid some of your massive hostile negotiations and how you see it show up at the moment, people getting into flow or getting into a flow state amidst or within negotiation. Yeah, well, you know, great negotiation, great listening is really being completely in the moment, in the flow state. I mean, 
You get into a process that you rely on so that you can worry less about where it's going and you just get into it and, and feel it in the moment. I mean, begin to slightly anticipate what the next few moments are going to be. The interesting add-in for us when you're using the skills, like I can pick the next moment. Like if I know how you're going to react emotionally to something, I can get a very clear picture in my head to your emotional reaction. And I'll choose one. Most likely what I'm going to choose is I know if you're not going to like what I'm getting ready to say. If I just say it, you're going to be angry, miffed. I'm going to trigger your negative emotions in some fashion. I could do that. Or I could simply stop that moment from ever happening. And you'll never know that I did that. So it's very much a flow state in the moment when you understand how our hostage negotiation, emotional intelligence skills are going to work. And I get to choose the next couple of moments. Because I see him coming at me and I make selections. Chris, how do you, and maybe the answer you already gave it, which is staying focused on the process, but there's such emotional ups and downs in a negotiation. And that is such a flow blocker for so many people, right? We Like when we train people on distraction management and, you know, when they go from, you know, bed to desk in the morning, we often say, you know, try to go as quickly as you possibly can. And for God's sake, don't look at your cell phone because that's, you know, an emotional landmine and it can totally pull you out. And yet you're in a situation where there are emotional landmines. I don't, you're negotiating around them. You're also often also hearing bad news. And yet you're trying to maintain not only state, but flow. How do you do that? You know, it's going to sound stupid, but it's just as much an, enough rehearsal that you come to rely upon the process and okay. then I didn't know that I knew this for the longest time till it finally jumped out at me you know the process can't be perfect like my old boss Gary Nessner used to always preach here's our best chance of success best chance of success and we were successful over and over and over and then something went bad and then I said to myself well, I guess if I've been saying best chance of success that's not guarantee of success which means something is going to go bad. So that's just part of the process. In many ways, I think as soon as you start losing your fear of it going bad, by simply to accept that it can. The simple acceptance that it can go bad. Look, it could go bad. That's a possible outcome. I saw that happen in a negotiation I was coaching in the Philippines. Guy was a superstar. His brother's life was at stake. And afterwards, I had him come in and lecture at a business negotiation course I was teaching at Georgetown at the time. And I remember he said to me, I, I got no idea what I talk about. You say I perform really well, but, you know, I took your coaching and I realized early on that my brother could get killed and I just accepted that. And I said, that's exactly all I need you to say. Because your acceptance that it could go bad essentially freed you up. And then you got into the moment. I mean, he was, he was astonishing. He took the coaching. He was coachable. He came up with some stuff that we didn't coach him on. He, you know, he processed it in his brain. And we saved his brother's life. Wow. So building that kind of outcome independence. Very well put. How do you maintain? So, let me ask you a question. Hold on. I got I, I, yeah, I to gotta ask a geeky question because that's what I'm here <laughs> for. That's what I'm here for. So... Because you know about the challenge skills balance in flow, right? And that flow sits right in the middle of it. It seems like by accepting the worst possible outcome, essentially what you're doing is lowering cognitive load, which is counterintuitive. But by accepting that the terrible thing could happen or this is really going on, we all had, by the way, I think we all experienced this in the early days of COVID, right? Those early days, you had a lot of resistance and this was so crazy heavy and then you went oh this really is happening like oh i'm in the middle of a crisis i got to get into crisis mode okay it's a different game cognitive load lightened and you got present that's the trick your shift that's what we're talking about in a weird way yes yeah no? i think so yeah okay yeah, absolutely. interesting yeah, yeah, yeah that is one last geeky question that's counterintuitive that accepting the worst possible outcome frees up energy, focus, 
right? It actually, mm -hmm. we're accepting the worst possible outcome actually has incredible high performance benefits is the point we're making. Yeah. Why is that the case? Do you have any idea? As we're talking about it, I'm trying to think through the steps, you know, because I mean, I, you know, I, I got my sort of success library be, behind me, although that I could populate it with Stephen Kotler books and would crowd all the other books out of the way. So I can't quite do that. <laughs> But, uh, you know, so one of them kissing will get you very far in the interview, Chris. <laughs> very, very That's far. Charm. It's you know, I, I got to tell you something, too. You know, I'm, I'm blown away that you can write fiction also. And not, not that many nonfiction guys can write fiction. But um, I came uh, It's where you started. The actual, the harder one was uh, learning to write nonfiction. Because I came up as a poet. And then I became a novelist. That was a very tricky weird shift but it sort of made i got there but by shifting into actual like real things with real people and you know that stuff that was hard but being a reporter wasn't hard because the same level of detail you have to notice to be a good negotiator you have to notice to be a good fiction writer you have to notice to be a good reporter and by the way i had to notice all that shit because i was a good bartender first right and i worked on tips so i had to know what you were feeling and how to make you feel better very very quickly with some alcohol involved because i needed to pay my rent yeah yeah pay the bills that's a master class in emotional intelligence being a bartender. It is. yeah all right so forgive me um over my other shoulder eric barker writes barking up the wrong tree writes a blog by the same name one of his blog pieces, he talked about samurai. And he said, how did the samurai lose their fear of death? Did they ignore it? And he writes, they thought about it all the time. Just that it's an outcome. And they thought about it so much and accepted it was an outcome, they lost their fear of death. Now, there's a next step in there. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's very much like what you talked about, where you sort of release that burden in the cognitive load, and you can get more in the moment. Not to make it too woo, but it sounds like there's an element of surrender before going in. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah, it, it might be. Some of us react differently to the word surrender. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you're also you're, you're maintaining a, some level of paradox, and that obviously you're going as hard as possible for the outcome you want, while being okay in a certain respect with any outcome. And that's what I wanted to ask you about: is how do you maintain outcome independence while also sticking to a backstop, being clear with you? are not going to settle for anything less around. How do you reconcile those two? Uh, basically, uh, letting all of it go. And then for me, it's just, this was a big conversation with Tall when we wrote the book, because we wanted to write a book and said, like, no goals whatsoever in the negotiation. And he said, well, human beings don't work that way. they got to have goals. And so then, well, basically what we're doing is our, our aspirational goal is actually our minimum. You know, I intellectually and emotionally know there's a better deal to be had. And the more fixated I get on any outcome, whether it be positive or negative, the less likely it is that I'm going to find the best deal possible. So it's just completely, and again, Zen's not my word or Tai Chi, but, you know, Tal said, this is like Tai Chi, it's like Zen, you're very Zen-like, you know. And my answer was like, I don't know. I, okay, if you say so. But all I know is I got to find the maximum best outcome to clear my mind completely. I got to let go of positives and negatives. And so if people ask us about goals, I say, well, think about what your aspiration is and realize that by definition, it's too low. And your goal is to exceed that. Is this, and I, by the way, I understanding that there is a somewhat flexible script, essentially, that's underneath how you're thinking about negotiation, meaning there's training. This is what to do in this situation kind of stuff, which your book is awesome about. How many laps until through? Is this a 10,000 hour thing? So my question is, why does this skill that seems so hard, you can actually learn it fairly. It's sort of like flow in that way. It's this thing that seems really hard, but it's readily trainable. And then it takes a lifetime to kind of master the execution mm. of. Yeah, well, a couple of things. First of all, yes, it seems hard just because you're hitting a new neural circuit and you're just not used to firing that circuit. We got an exercise we do in training all the time where we have people just do this with their hands, you know, switch thumb to forefinger. That's ridiculously simple. The first time people do it, they're going like, ah, ah, and their head almost explodes <laughs> because they just haven't fired those circuits. So the repetition to just get some sort of competence there is 
actually somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60 repetitions, which is why frequently anecdotally, I've never seen any hard evidence, but everybody says anecdotally, it takes three weeks to pick up a skill. Well, if you're hitting a, a few reps every day, it's going to take you about three weeks to get to 60-ish reps. In terms of negotiation, it might be exactly what you're talking about with flow. To get a little bit better in negotiation and emotional intelligence, we'll almost instantaneously have a 23, 31, 75% increase in your ability compared to everybody else. Your initial leap is going to jump you significantly in front of everyone. Now, mastery then comes in decreasing increments. Mm -hmm. And of course, every time you master it, you're going to pull ahead of some other people. But just to get a little bit better in negotiations and have it have a substantial immediate impact on your life isn't that hard. And then at that point in time, you know, it's, it's that old analogy. You know, the two hikers are confronted with a bear in the woods. And one guy stops to put on his tennis shoes and his buddy says, your tennis shoes ain't going to help you outrun the bear. And he says, I don't got to outrun the bear. I just got to outrun you. It doesn't take that much before you're outrunning the pack and making a huge difference in your life. And then, you know, then you got time to put in the 10,000 hours because you got more time back in your life. You're making more money. You're wasting less time. Your relationships are better. People want to collaborate with you. And it's a virtuous circle that takes off really fast. What's the first big thing, Chris, that you find gets people to that 80-20? first big shift or insight or thing they need to understand? You know, it's usually going to be one of about three things. It's sort of depend upon how they've gotten to where they are. They're either going to get out of asking yes-oriented questions and switch over to no-oriented questions. Instead of saying, do you agree, they're going to say, do you disagree? Instead of saying, does this look like something that would work for you? They say, are you against doing this? Instead of saying, have you got a few minutes to talk? They say, is now a bad time to talk? You know, if you can just switch out of yes to no questions, and there are seven or eight yes questions everybody asks every day, and flipping them to no is a real simple thing. People will just go like, good God, what just happened? You know, so that could be it. They might not be good at saying no gently, letting it know out a little at a time. So that shift is just learning instead of saying no or blowing up or pretending to go along, they might learn to say, how am I supposed to do that? Then, then bang, something massive happens. I get a story of a mom use that on her 13 year old kid who was bugging her to buy a video game for him. She said, how am I supposed to do that? His immediate response was, all right, so I'll pay half. You know, he immediately cut his price by half. I got another guy dealing with a landscaper at his house and the guy gives him a price for all the landscaping. And he says, how am I supposed to do that? And the landscaper immediately cuts his price by half. You know, so that might be the other skill of people kicking the gear really quickly. When I teach writing, one of the things I talk about is you can do certain things, certain sentences with language to produce a dopamine response. Ah. And one of the things is hyperbation, which is a fancy way of saying scrambling word order. So this is Yoda's Star okay. Wars. Size matters, not judge me, not by my size, do you, right? <laughs> Hemingway used to do this. He went to the river. The river was there. All kinds of like, with it's not quite what you, and what your brain has to sort of unscramble it a little bit. And it forces you, when you unscramble the puzzle, you not only get dopamine, which drives focus, but you get pattern recognition from the dopamine. And that allows you to get the new knowledge and the new feeling. How can I do that produces empathy, very quickly, right? That forces the listener into empathy. That's what you're doing with that question, right? And it demands that they see you as a person. It's interesting. And the word order is, I think, why it does that. If there's like hyperbation, the same technique you can use in literature, you can use out loud here. That's interesting. I don't know if that's it, but and I don't even know if it's a comment or a question. But no, you're a thousand, you're a thousand percent on the money, and you, you describe it almost word to word, word for word, the same way my son Brandon has. He's called it forced empathy. It forces a thought pattern in the other side, and the word how to start that sentence off is critical. And yeah, you're forcing empathy into a situation, which then, of course, triggers a bunch of the neurochemicals that you're talking about. Does that mean, Chris, that if you're attempting to get the other side to 
be more empathetic. But how do you deal with having empathy on your side? I've noticed even in myself sometimes, and this, this might sound a little bit sociopathic, but I've actually turned video off when negotiating because I find it challenging to do a hard negotiating if I'm seeing their face because it's arising maybe excessive empathy in myself. So how do you think about being empathetic yourself? Because obviously it's also critical from a listening and understanding standpoint. So how do you get an amazing deal without being overly empathetic? Yeah, well, you're sort of conflating, if that's the right word, empathy with sympathy. And sympathy is going to cause you a problem. Empathy is a hostage negotiator, as I would define it, as Harvard would define it, one of Daniel Goleman's definitions of it got nothing to do with your emotions. It's got you identifying the other side's emotions completely. And so your emotions might kick into gear at some point in time afterwards. But it's just really identifying the emotional, the emotions, the cognitive biases, the affects, the reactions from the other side. And then by definition, Goldman says, he calls it cognitive empathy. And he says it's a type of empathy that sociopaths are actually best at. And it's insanely effective. Chris, you said there were three interventions that could make the most difference, right? One was the negative, yes questions to no questions. The second one was how am I supposed to do that for the empathy trigger? So what's the third big bit of kung fu you think that makes the biggest difference? Well, being able to restate the other side's position, especially the negative aspects of their position that are pointed at you. And that is... You immediately take a quantum leap when you get good at that. And a lot of people just have a lot of trouble bringing themselves to it. It's just, it's massively, it's probably the single most deeply rooted counterintuitive so thing. This is me saying to my wife, honey, I can see why you think this is totally this irresponsible of me, or that is not what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really close. I mean, I'd, I'd alter your deliver a little bit because there's some word choices in there. That very much like what you're talking about, different words having different impacts that are either working for or against you. But you're real close, you know, and, and especially with, with a... Coach me up. What do you do? I can see that I've made you angry. Okay. I can see that you see this as a stupid thing for me to have done. So you're, you're labeling. Yeah, it's labeling. It's a little bit of an adjustment in the label. Like the closer... There's sometimes our labels are sort of like tentative checks. Most of the time, it's you seem angry. Like, uh, you know, one of my, the first time I begin to learn the difference, the ex Mrs. Voss were having a discussion a long time ago in a galaxy far away. She's really upset with me. And I said, You sound angry. And I think her brain matter splattered all over me in the entire room when she blew up. <laughs> And I remember thinking at the time, but I say you sound angry on the hotline all the time, and it works. I don't understand why this isn't working here. What I should have said, instead of you sound angry, as if like I was surprised, my proper response would have been, I could see that I've made you angry. Now, I've dropped the word uh -huh. I in there. It's an awareness on my part. People, the closer somebody is to you, or the more upset they are about the situation, they don't want you to be tentative about it. They want you to know. And that's when we shift from sounds like you're angry to I know you're angry. We coach people up to say, instead of saying like, seems like the situation has probably got you upset to I know you're upset. I know you're scared. I know you're worried about the future. The word I there is placed strategically with I know at the very beginning. So there's very, some very conscious word choice there depending upon how close somebody is to you or what they expect of you. I used to walk into a kidnapped victim's family and I couldn't say, seems like this situation's probably got you scared. I'd have to say, I know you're scared and I know you're angry. And they would snap out of it almost instantaneously because they needed to know that I knew. And so depending upon the severity of the situation or the closeness of the relationship, you need to make that shift in a label. It makes it sound much less accusational as well when you make that switch. Yeah, 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 good point. Just brought on a new sales guy, funnily enough, in the last two weeks. And in his first week, he just had this massive surge in his conversion rate on calls. And we were trying to, we were digging in, we were trying to figure out what the hell it was, what he was doing differently. And ultimately realized that 
what he had been doing differently to our other guys been on long term is just listening much more and not allowing patterns or you know things that have been frequently heard again and again and again to block from actively listening within the actual engagement, which was then resulted in much better questions and much better realizations on behalf of the person that he's talking to. And then obviously that's translating to better results. So I'm curious as to how you think about listening and any advice that you have on improving listening. Yeah, well, I can see that happening, especially with a new guy. I mean, there's a lot of things which you guys have probably done research on on beginner's mind. But somebody who's new is gonna be more curious. He's not going to be reacting to sort of past patterns that, that he felt the defeat from. So the more curious you are, I mean, the more you're going to hear. It's a highly positive frame of mind. Your pattern recognition is going to be there. You can't get in your own way and be curious at the same time. Genuine curiosity is a great hack for listening and hearing the other side. So a new guy's probably going to just automatically tend into that more because he's going to be much more in the moment. He's not defeating himself based on predictable patterns and, you know, our biases, which just massively get in our way. And, you know, something might have gone wrong one time in 10, but we all, our survival mechanism overreacts to every time you get a whiff of that. There's so many ways that we get in our way, which requires some real attention to stay out of until you're locked into staying out of that. And even then, it still requires attention because eventually you're gonna fall out of that mode if you don't do some maintenance. Chris, when you train people to get past their cognitive biases, years ago I got a chance to talk to Dan Kahneman about this. Um, uh, and, wow, uh, what a conversation that was must great. have been. It was amazing. And what I wanted to know is it seems like our cognitive biases, and this may be a cognitive bias itself that it seems this way, but it seems like they fall into categories, like patterns. And I was talking to Dan Kahneman, I was like, could you ever organize them that way? Could you trace them back to underlying neurochemistry, neural anatomy, like actual brain changes in each category of cognitive bias? So we could find out are there categories of errors. And he had tried to do it at one point, but we're just not there yet in terms of our ability to kind of measure thought in a sense. That said, he agreed with me, but he couldn't do it in any way. Do you think there's any way to broadly categorize cognitive biases as types of errors so you can help people steer around that? Yeah, I think there has to be. And I put this caveat, probably a starting point of one of three categories, you know, okay. for lack of a better term. I mean, we believe that there are three instinctive approaches to conflict, fight, flight, make friends, and that the okay. world splits pretty evenly into thirds. So I think it would probably start there. And, and that's why I talk like, I mean, we're seeing broadly kind of three sorts of initial bad habits. I'm not sure entirely how that relates to type it, it we still keep running into this thirds thing and you can still be ridiculously unique individual but you can get a head start based on type i mean how many duplicate fingerprints are there not only in the world today but in the history of mankind as far as we know none and ideally there's roughly at least 70 billion separate fingerprints in existence on a planet today 10 prints for each person 7 billion people but there are only three types of fingerprints so you can start with type, and as long as that doesn't define your thinking, it can give you a head start on categories. Do you find people who are instinctively wired for fight in a negotiation, where did they run into trouble? Where did, like, I'm wired to make friends. That's how I like to negotiate. And when I get in a negotiation with somebody who runs away from negotiations, it's a fine situation for me. I know how to work with fear and that sort of stuff. When I come in with hardcore type A's who just like to fight, I so hate fighting that I'm often so annoyed that I, right. I won't, you know, I'm not even like, no, if that's how you play, I don't want to play. There are, of course, situations where I'm forced into that, you know, into that category. So do you notice that certain types work better with other types? And how do you, if you're a make friends person, you're, you know, in there with a fight person, it, categorical solves or it's all individual the kung fu works across the boards yeah interesting all right so the make friends person is going to make more deals they're going to tend to be not as many of them going to be home runs like the fight guy just pays attention to home runs and not a batting average but at some point in time both the fight guy and the flight guy is a very highly analytical person right they both begin to notice that the make friends person is making more deals. 
They're not envious of the deals. But at some point in time, they begin to notice that the make friends person makes more deals. And depending upon their ability to learn, how open they are to learning, how long it takes them to figure that out. But in many cases, especially the analytical type, a lot of analysts will, the flight type will masquerade as a make friends type because they think about the process so much that they notice that the other person smiles a lot and it had an impact. That's data. I think there's a whole breed of academic that is exactly that person. They're a flight person disguised as a make friends person. <laughs> and when you try to do science with them, you see it because the stuff that should be like done, wrapped, analyzed, published, and walked away from in like three, four months, like just a quick, you know, it's three years later and they can't get past the data. You're like, oh my God, I got con. I got con once again. Yeah, 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 yeah. They want to get it right. Yeah. My daughter in law is our chief of marketing, our company. She is the bubbliest person you ever met in your life. She laughs, she's delightful. She is one analytical assassin. She has learned to have this great bubbly exterior, and she's an analyst just deep down to her bones. So I get a question off the back of that, uh, Chris. As a make friends person, or again, as someone maybe who's, who's overly empathetic or overly sympathetic, how do you avoid compromise? I don't know if it's Irish guilt or what it is, but sometimes I just feel bad. You know, for getting an overly good deal, feel like I've run a steamrolled over the other person or put them out. Is that just a simple mindset issue, or like, how do you think about that? You know, it's a focus issue, and you got to get out of the focus in the moment and a focus long term because compromise long term is bad for everybody. And if you get a make friends person realizing that they're actually hurting the other person by compromising, and they are, because that means that you didn't get anywhere near an optimal outcome. I mean, just, there's just nothing good about compromise. Compromise is not the same as a high-value trade. You know, a high-value trade, a uh, guy makes shoes, goes to the dairy farmer, trades shoes for milk. He feeds his family, dairy farmer gets shoes. Compromise is like, yeah, you know what, I know I need a gallon of milk, but I'll take a half a gallon, I'll give you one shoe. So the dairy farmer, if he goes for that compromise, he, he walks back with one shoe or maybe, all right, so maybe I can come back the next day to get the other shoe. I mean, there's nothing about compromise that good. The high value trade is a full set of shoes for a full gallon of milk. But somehow this idea of compromise has gotten in negotiation as an admirable trade. Our politicians want to compromise. How do you feel about compromising your integrity? If compromise was a good word, then compromising your integrity would be a good thing. And it is not. So understanding the difference between the two is where the real critical issue lies on great negotiation. If someone comes to you and says something like, you know, I'm a pussy when it comes to negotiation, usually what are they doing wrong? Or what equates to being a pussy in negotiation? That's a phrase. I just, I just, I just, I just, can, can we back it up one step? I want to know how many people actually use that exact phrase? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's a common one. <laughs> well, you know what? They'll say it to themselves, though. You know, what's a voice in your head saying? They might not come out with it, but what's in a voice in their head say? Probably if they're so relationship-oriented, that they find themselves being taken hostage to the happiness of the other side on a regular basis and only see it in a moment. Because the other thing too is like, if you do that to yourself, if you didn't assert your own best interest with the other side, the other side's got to take a wag, a wild ass guess as to whether or not they're giving you something that's any good. And you ain't never going to talk to them again. What you're going to do after you get out of that interaction is do everything you could possibly do to avoid engaging with them ever again because the deal hurt you. It was a bad deal. And so you're hurting people in so many ways by not being assertive. It's just you don't want to be assertive. Don't be a jerk when you're assertive. You know, don't, don't be blunt force trauma. But people got to know where you're coming from to make a deal so you'll deal with them again. And it's all about being taken hostage to the moment rather than understanding long-term compromise is going to hurt us both. And we're not going to want to do business with each other ever again. That is a phenomenal quote, being taken hostage to the happiness of the other side. I love that. That's great. Chris, first of all, how familiar are you with group flows, triggers? 
Well, you know, there's a really interesting book called Stealing Fire that I read that enlightened me to some degree. So uh, somewhat. <laughs> I heard something about that book. I can't remember what it was. But anyways, um, in negotiations, it's not always a possibility, is it? I'm just wondering how much some of the group flow triggers map onto if you go into a negotiation would they be stuff you're doing with your own team? Are they things you're playing with with the other person? Even if it could be a hostile negotiation, how do you think about those questions? I think about them first in terms of my team. You know, how do we all get collectively our brain into this moment so that we're supporting each other? And we had uh, in hostage negotiation, a strong team game, and not every team was capable of that. But in a strong team game, it's very definitely group flow. I mean, we'll do rehearsals in a moment. We'll predict dialogue, not just one dialogue, but a whole variety of dialogues. Another negotiation I'm coaching in the Philippines, all of our coaching notes were in English. The negotiation was taking place in Tagalog. We dialed into the tone of voice of our negotiator. And when he got done off the phone, he said, are you, you guys sure you don't speak Tagalog? Because you pointed to all the notes in English at exactly the right times. And we were dialed, we prepped, we'd gotten ready, we considered multiple outcomes, and then we really dialed into his tone of voice. So we would think about it very much in terms of our side supporting one another. It's something we're currently building out now for business negotiation, because we're doing that with each other. If I get an important negotiation on the phone, I'll never get on there alone. I want my team members there in support of me, and we dial in together. We're now actually in the process of teaching business people how to do that. Some of the stuff that we just invented in our training was completely designed for that. Group flow would have been on our side, yeah. I have been toying with the idea of vulnerability in certain respects. is almost like a meta group flow trigger in that it results in familiarity and risk which are other group flow triggers that have been actually identified. But how do you think about vulnerability with respect to negotiation? Is it a helpful thing to disclose? Yeah, that, you know, they're, they're different, they're different emotional reactions to the word. You know, like, um, unfortunately, I'm, you know, I'm a fight guy. My natural default mode is to fight. So vulnerability to me is like somebody says you be more vulnerable. I'm like, fuck you. I'm not doing that. That's a <laughs> stupid thing. But then I'll tell something personal about myself and people dial in and connect mm. i mean you know the master class that i just did they teased the story out of me at the very end about getting bullied as a kid and how it affected what i prey upon you know i'm the sheepdog that goes after the bullies you know the wolves i go after bullies my life's dedication is really from that moment on have been to go after the big bullies that were picking on the little guys and everybody goes like, wow, you were so vulnerable in a moment. I'm like, all right, fine. I was vulnerable. You know, I, I don't know about vulnerable. So it depends upon, I guess it's a rambling answer to vulnerability is a very good thing at triggering empathy from the other side. It's an enormously powerful tool. Some of us would pick another word for it because mm -hmm. our instinctive reaction is like, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know about this warm and fuzzy stuff. <laughs> That's my type. That makes total sense. So, yeah, I think another word like maybe authentic, genuine, down See, to Yeah, I think authentic. Yeah, authentic yeah. is a great word for me. I resonate with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I definitely get the downside to the word vulnerability for sure. Which, a, which is a good point. When you pick your word, your adjective, your synonym, you probably ought to think of at least two others to go with it. Because we'd be in a conversation, and if you said to me, wow, you know, I appreciate you being so vulnerable, I'd be like, screw you. But if you just said, man, I appreciate how authentic you would be, like, I'd be puffed up by that. I'd resonate with that word. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's your adjective? Your adjective might not be the other guy's adjective. So would you string it together? Would you be like, Chris, I really appreciate you being really vulnerable, really authentic with me today. It was really that nice. Would be a, that Let, would be let a, it hang that, out. That's a step up. It's an absolute step up in your connecting with the other side. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So I got a question for you, Chris, about conflict in general and how to, like one of the things we teach in peak performance is, is the lean in instinct and rising to the challenge and being willing to have that instinctual tendency to just go for things. 
with respect to conflict, how do you develop that same kind of ability to just lean into conflict, thrive in it, savor it in the same way that you can train yourself to do that with a cold shower or a tough workout? Repetition. In small stakes practice for high stakes results. And then just be willing to drop into it, say, you know what? I got nothing to lose here. When you feel you got no stake, when you're worried about something, and then you'll try it, you'll be astonished. I mean, I just to get some practice in the other day, I called to get some charges taken off a credit card that I completely, completely owed. And I'm just like, you know what? I need to practice. And I'm completely good if they make me pay everything because I owe everything. And I went through it, and the guy was giddy when he waived all the charges. But I just went in just so You practice. called up your credit card company. <laughs> you actually owed them money for shit you bought and just talked them out of it. Well, I paid for the stuff that I bought, but I just flat missed several months' payments in a row. So there was no question that all the late fees and all the interest fees Got it. were completely legitimate. And I thought, yeah, well, you know, let, you know, let me get some practice. And these are legitimate charges. I can't be upset here. So let me see what happens. The guy, and the guy literally, when I got off the phone, he literally said completely genuinely, it was a pleasure helping you today. And I thought, the employee of a company I just took money from that I legitimately agreed I should have paid told me it was a pleasure to give me my money back. <laughs> That kind of gives rise to another interesting question. What is it, do you think, that was making that a pleasure for him? Well, everybody else he talked to that day called to beat his ass. So almost every phone conversation he had was an unpleasant conversation. And then I, in fact, you know, he felt like he was genuinely doing something really great. So I danced him through it. I mean, I started out, you know, we don't price anchor, but we emotional anchor. And all this is really predictable. I'm calling somebody, customer service rep from a credit card company, and nobody calling him to be nice. And there are enough people that have gotten 10% off by being jerks. They didn't realize they could have gotten 100% off by being nice. They just remember the times they got the 10% off. So I know what this guy's, his emotions are very predictable to start out with. I call him on the phone, and when he picks up the phone, I say, I'm getting ready to make your day ridiculously painful. And there's this long silence on the other end of the phone. And finally, this sigh and this acquiescence, because he's got to talk to me. He can't hang up. It's his job. And he goes, okay, what is it? And then I go through a couple of more emotional intelligence things. I don't know what he's imagining. I just know whatever he's imagining is a lot worse than me asking for my late fees to be waived. And as soon as I get to my ask, he's like, wow, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And now he's, now he's the happiest camper on the planet. It was the happiest he'd been all day, probably that week. And so by the time I got off the phone, it was a pleasure to help me just because he felt phenomenal when I got done. Can you clarify, because that's such an important point, the emotional anchor. Can you clarify what you mean by that for folks? Yeah, well, you know, we talked about the survival mechanisms in the brain being overly negative. If I just throw something out initially and let his imagination run wild, if I say, I'm going to make your day horrible. You're not going to like what I have to say. This is going to sound harsh. I got a lousy proposition for you. And then just shut up and let the limbic system, their amygdala, take off on them. It's 75% negative. They're going to imagine, you know, God knows what they're going to imagine. You know, depending upon the circumstances, at least they're going to imagine you berating them intensely and calling them names. That's what they brace themselves for. So whatever happens from that moment forward is better than what they brace themselves for. It's an immediately a release. I know how the amygdala works. I know how the limbic system works. If I let it run wild negatively, it will. So let me emotional anchor low. Then the entire experience, even, even if I get nothing, by the time we're done, he's going to feel better at the end than he did when the call started or what his mindset was before he picked up the phone. So I'm going to leave him in a better place than he was. One of our foundational principles at The Collective is when people talk about peak performance, what you're really talking about is just getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. And I'm listening to you talk, and it's the same. The principles are, the, I, and which I think now that I say that out loud, of course, there's so much resonance between our work 
for this exact reason. It's both based on, and you know, it's funny. I was talking to my editor, Michael Warden, really good friend of mine who I've worked with for a very long time over the weekend. And he was talking about how he took it personally. Like when he learned about peak performance, like you have to, you, earlier you said, you got to tune optimism every day. It's like brushing your teeth. You just right at that sort of thing. Like we talk about the positive psychology basics, which is that just that there's six things, positive psychology said, you've got to do this shit every day. Yeah, you can skip one of them every now and again and be fine. And it's like, if you're not doing those things, you can't even get into the peak performance conversation. Those are the stuff that you do to go from subpar back to zero. Peak performance, right, you got to be at zero or at least, you know, close to it to really start taking off because it's just, you need a stable foundation to handle the acceleration is how Can I you think just quickly mention those things, Stephen? The positive Oh, I, you know, to me, they could be six or seven, actually. So there's sleep, obviously. Hydration, nutrition, obviously. Social support, need other people in our lives because otherwise lives feel too risky and mess with our head. Then gratitude, mindfulness, exercise. And then the big one is also, I guess, what Carol Dweck calls mindset. And what I learned is locus of control, which is you either believe you're in charge of your life and can affect change in your life or you don't. And if you don't, believe you can affect change in your life and change in the world you can't do anything else life happens to you you're a victim and you've given up all your power literally which is odd but it seems to work that way and you know which is why carol dweck basically found you know the growth mindset is so foundational people have a fixed mindset you just can't get better so there's those six or seven things depending on how you look at them and in your ability to control it that theme emerges disguised in a lot of ways. Like if you say to yourself, the universe has your back, well, then that puts you in a positive mindset. Or, you know, I put up on my Instagram just the other day, the Latin for fortune favors a bold, which means like if the universe has your back, then that means basically the batting average is in your favor. And if the batting average is in your favor, you want to be successful, just keep going back to bat because it's better than 51%, which is why fortune favors a bold. They just keep getting back up to bat. (laughs) I think that's true, right? One of the defining traits of genius isn't that they just produce exceptional works of genius. It's that they produce a ton of work, and a lot of it is crap. Some of it is genius. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Vaughn, just keep going. Yeah, the get more reps piece of advice is great on that. Like, that's it's so simple and practical, but a lot of people don't think about calling up their credit card company to practice before a big negotiation they have anyway professionally. And I'm curious, Chris, if you can give us a bit of a rundown on negotiation prep. Let's say, for example, someone is listening now within the next month as a big negotiation on pay or something with their business partner they're, they're dreading, let's say. Um, how do you prep for that mentally, physically, practically? Well, some of your most effective prep is to be willing to call out all the negatives. I mean, what are the elephants in a room that are against you? I mean, if you could get and just calling it out. You know, what would you want to deny? Instead of denying it, just calling out. Instead of just saying, like, you come in, you want something more from your partner. You know that your partner is going to see you, your, your colleague, your partner, your employer, whoever it is. You know they're going to see that as selfish. You wish they wouldn't, and you'd want to say, look, I don't want you to think I'm selfish here. Whatever you'd want to deny, instead, take the two millimeter shift and go, look, look this is probably going to seem like I'm selfish. You know, if you can make that shift, now, the first few times you prepare to do that, it'll make you feel dirty. You're going to feel self-loathing. You're going to stay up late at night. It's going to make you feel so bad, dirty, and ugly. And if you finally bring yourself to do it, the result is going to be so astonishingly in your favor that you're going to literally go, I don't understand what just happened. But that's probably the single most powerful thing you could do. One of the guys we coached, Big fan of our stuff. We call this the accusations audit. He was telling us in a, in a Zoom call, he stayed up for two nights listing out all the negatives the other side was going to say about him, and it made him feel dirty. He's an IT guy. He's needed a client to replace their server. His best outcome was if they were going to buy one server. They bought three. <laughs> So that's the most powerful prep you can do. 
be willing to call out the negatives just like they're there and that you're completely fearless about them. You'll be shocked at the difference that will make. Plus, if you can reconcile yourself to that in the conversation, there's nothing they can throw at you that's going to catch you off guard. That sounds like almost doing an emotional anchor on yourself so that you're not susceptible to it as well in a certain respect on, in the actual negotiation. That's a really interesting point. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think you're completely right on that. I'm going to pretend like I came up with that insight myself. <laughs> Feel free. No, it's great. That's super helpful. Though. Chris, I know we're, we're a little close to coming up on time. Got one more question for you then, Stephen. I'm sure you got a couple of quick questions to wrap there. You mentioned the idea in your book of creating your own reality or kind of determining the reality or the paradigm for the negotiation. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how people can do that? Well, it's just an awareness of how prospect of loss impacts people. Fear of loss is the decision-making element. If you see things differently from somebody else, you guys are focusing on different laws. You know, and interesting, Stephen talks about conversation with Kahneman, Danny Kahneman, prospect theory. Lost things twice as much as in Boston. Yeah. It, it bends people's reality. And I can completely bend your perception based on how I pose loss. Not how I pose gain, but how I pose loss. Completely change your mind, completely change my own mind about it. So do a loss calculation, understand that's the way the brain works, and tee up your thinking and what you articulate based around that. Does that relate to frame control? Is that a form of frame? It's probably exactly the same thing. You know, if I'm looking to buy your company and you want an 8X multiple, and I can only give you 6X, but if you let me buy and I can give you $100 million down the road, but you want to get an 8X because your buddy got an 8X, I'll say something effective. So it sounds like you're willing to sacrifice $100 million tomorrow for the $2 million today. And you'll be like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds stupid when you put it like that. But that's just teeing up the loss. That's great. Yeah, I love that. You were going to mention something there, Sue? Oh, I was, it was my final question. I notice in writing that the loss aversion, like if you've written something and you're doing a long book, the loss aversion is you really don't want to have to go back and rewrite it. You want it to be locked. You want it to be, it's solid, it's done. And it produces an enormous amount of functional fixedness. You'll read over the same thing a hundred times that will eventually have to get changed because it's crappy and you will not see it's crappy because you don't want to actually like put all the effort in. You're like I see it all the time. When I work my way through a book, every quarter of the book, I'll go back to the beginning and start reading again just to try to get past it and say, okay, I'll, this will take a week and I'll just rewrite everything because I know other than that, because I've gotten to things where I've turned things into editors and they've come back to me and, the, and I thought it was amazing and they're, they're coming back to me and they're like, this is just crappy. And eventually I see that they're right. And the horror question is, how the hell did I not notice before? And the answer, in my opinion, and this is the question I was getting to you is, that strikes me as loss aversion leading to a kind of functional fix at this. What I'm wondering is if you could switch this, if I could go into writing, for example, randomly and be like, you know, I know this is going to need a ton of work down the line, but kind of that to get past the cognitive bias. Does that make any sense? No, yeah. I mean, again, it's, you know, what loss are you focusing on? And, and when you don't want to go back and rewrite it, you're focused on the loss of all that time that you time. already invested. Yeah. That's the loss you're focused right. on. How might I want to talk you into that or how might I want to talk myself into that? I might say, how long do I want to stare at this book on a shelf? Not selling. <laughs> that's, that's a good mood about it. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's a good question. How long do I want to stare at this book on a shelf not selling? Is very. I find that very motivating, Chris. Uh, yeah, the way... Just imagine quickly, Stephen, you've described that before, is killing your darlings. Not the phrase you use often. Well, that's a slightly different thing. That's not my phrase. That's Donald Barthame's phrase, a, a fiction writer who taught writing was really smart. That's, darlings are things that are too cute. It's like alliteration where you like, you just love something because it's fancy and it's cute. And the problem with darlings is they end up distracting the reader from the book often. 
Right. They take up a lot of space in somebody's head because you they're usually something beautiful that you crafted and it produces a lot of emotion and whatever, but it's like a tangent and it's going to just take a lot for the reader to kind of work through it. And yeah, so that there's some of that there also, but you end up having to kill those along the way too. But that's more functional fix, fixiveness. I mean, I think it shows up in everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I assume, you know, whatever you're good at, you have blind spots just basically because you've seen the same pattern too many times. Same thing you were talking about early on. A lot of what today's conversation has been about is high performance in the face of repeated patterns. Mm. And avoiding functional fixedness because you get those darlings on sales calls, you know, where you've got like a beautiful sentence in your head that you want to say when they stop talking, but you're just clinging to it, even though it's not the best thing to say. But Chris, I want to be conscious of your time. So... I know you have an incredible newsletter that everyone should definitely sign up to. Could you tell us a little more about that? And then you're doing a quarterly challenge, I believe, as well. And then you can mention that. And then just where else people can find out and learn more. About sure. The, uh, the newsletter we put out the edge is succinct and actionable and free. <laughs> I had a FBI colleague who used to like say, if it's free, I'll take three. But the most important thing is it's succinct, actionable. It comes out on Tuesday mornings. It'll tee you up. Tuesday morning, it's when people are kind of getting into the week. You get your Monday behind you, tune you up for negotiation on Tuesday morning. Short, sweet article coming into your email inbox. Plus, it's a gateway to everything that we do. we got training announcements. It's a gateway to the website. Whatever challenge you're faced with, we've written an article in The Edge in the past, which you can also search to look for. It doesn't matter what kind of, put the keywords in and search on our site. You'll find an article specifically tailored for what you're dealing with right now. Best way to sign up to subscribe, we've got a text to sign up function. You text the words black swan method, lowercase, doesn't matter, space between the words, to the number 33777, and that's 33777. If you put black swan method in, shot it out to that number, you'll get a response back asking for your email. You're off to the races. we got a ton of stuff that's free. You're going to want to get to the point where you get to some of our more complicated stuff, like one of our in-person training sessions, which we'll resume as soon as we're past the social distancing. But you got to be up to speed before you come to one of those sessions anyway. So the book and the newsletter will take you a long way. Great. That's super helpful, Chris. Thanks for that. And yeah, the book is just phenomenal. I absolutely love it. And, you know, if I may, you did mention our, we've got quarterly. We're doing a lot of stuff online now. We've got quarterly themes. It's a monthly call, actually, with a quarterly theme that you can tap into online. And that is selling. I mean, helping people with the challenges that they're faced with right now. So that, that a lot of people are finding that very helpful, especially with today's. We're always in a dynamic environment, no less so than today. I mean, it is even more dynamic. Super. That's great. Thanks for those, Chris. And, and thanks a million for your time. Hopefully we'll have you on again. Super interesting and helpful. Yeah, because people. this was amazing. You guys are a great conversation. You really are. <laughs> I, I take away stuff every time that I read something Stephen's written or hear something that he says. I appreciate what you're putting forth in the world. Thank you. I feel the same way about you. And I, I you know, as I said, I think we're playing the same game, right? It's the like, just figure out how shit works. Don't argue with it. Just, this, oh, this is how it works? Okay, cool. We're going to do this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Agree. Love that. Thank All you, right, Chris. Thanks. All right, guys. Take it easy. Thanks Take for it. having me on. Thanks a million. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. 